Yeah, I mean, I can take it away. Sure. So, you know, guys, as we know, vaginal bleeding, we have premenopausal, postmenopausal. Today, we're going to be discussing an older female, postmenopausal, because there's a lot of things to take into consideration, you know, and by, by all means, you also have to think about the, the differentials for the premenopausal too. So in this kind of case for the CS exam, you got to think to yourself, what are you going to say? Obviously, older female. She might be rude. She might be short with you. When I say short with you, meaning yes, no, that kind of a reaction, right? So she's going to try to like push you a little bit and challenge you. Might be quite difficult throughout the whole encounter, even when you first walk into the door. You know, she might start challenging you. So you have to be ready for that, not to put some fear in you, but as far as walking into these kind of encounters to know how to handle things. Okay, so, um, and as far as, you know, you have to be ready to talk about sensitive issues, uh, discussing certain issues and topics, for example, vaginal bleeding, right? So you might be a little embarrassed or shy, or she might be embarrassed and shy, especially if it's, if you're the male and she's a female, sometimes also to female physicians too. So you have to be aware of that and you have to be cautious because these are sensitive issues. You might be a little embarrassed to talk to you about certain things. So that's always to take into consideration. You know, um, uh, being empathetic and sympathetic, you have to be, you have to empathize with her, especially yeah, it goes a very, very long way. It reflects a high CIS score. We all know that, right? You have to be able to get your ice and sis and sep. So always, you know, take a, a couple extra seconds, talk to her, listen to her, especially if she's trying to tell you what's going on. There's bleeding down there versus vaginal bleeding. You have to pretty much figure out where the bleeding is. Um, and then mnemonics. So what do you guys think the mnemonics are going to be for this kind of a case? So we have a couple of mnemonics we're going to use, right? So there's vaginal bleeding. So throw up, uh, if you guys can, the mnemonics and see what kind of mnemonics we're talking about. I'm, I'm going to guess there's a lot of variations, but hopefully yeah, okay. everyone's Of course, on. there's different variations because obviously you have vaginal bleeding. Uh, it's OBGYN case. So, okay, good, good. good. A lot of people look like they uh, are pretty similar. I like the Papa one. <laughs> um, Papa, but, that's interesting. So, and again, I, good, yeah, go, know, go ahead. I mean, and again, the mnemonics at the end of the day, you can make it however you want, as long as you remember them on exam day. We yeah. just use these because they work for, it's one of those universal keys, right? We deal with students and physicians and people that have been doing research for 10 years. So this is like an overall uh, mnemonic that we use that really helps everybody out. Okay, good. So we have Havoc, of course, because she's postmenopausal. Also, guys, A B O, right? A B A B C O. We asked because, them the other day. Let's ask. Remember, we asked them the other day. Let's see if they remember. Because it's bleeding. So, what do you guys think that means again, right? So, what do we have, what do we have on board. Okay, amount. All right, A is amount. Good. What's B for? Good. C color. Okay, great. What else? There's a lot of C's. Okay, so color, consistency, clots, content. Okay. And then O is odor. Okay, good. All right, collapse, good, good, good. Um, and good. we'll discuss a little later, obviously, the mnemonics. But the whole point is, this is the game plan you need to know before you walk in. You might say, Doc, Dr. Star Wars, Dr. Paul, how do, we, how do we do this? Well, that's how training comes in. You, when you open that little doorway info and you see 69-year-old female, whatever the case might be, vaginal bleeding, automatically, boom, the mnemonics have to pop, write them down, the differentials, and move on into the case. All right? So one thing to remember, everybody, Time management is very important. I mean, we're talking about a lot of mnemonics, review of systems you still have to ask. Pam hits false, sad, wad toes, wad sad toes, you still have to ask that. So management, managing time is going to be very, very tricky, especially if she's rude or a little short with you, because that could psychologically mess with you, right? Person's kind of rude and you're like, well, but I do wrong. So these are the things, these are the points you have to remember at the door before you walk inside the actual case. Right. Yeah. We haven't even really... That. Sorry, yeah, we haven't really even dove into the case yet. These are just things to keep in mind, right? Just at the doorway, you know, putting on the blue sheet, why it's blue, who knows, but it's a blue sheet and you have to put that information down. Right. So you don't forget it. So just as a little project for you guys, I want you to sort of simmer on this. I'm going to I'm gonna bring someone on later and I'm going to ask you a challenging question. And it's going to be, if I'm a patient and I'm a female and you walk in and I and I see that you're a male, I'm going to say to you, can I get a female doctor? Well, so I'm going to bring someone on later and I, and I want, I'm going to give you guys some time to reflect on this and I want you to give me the perfect answer. Okay. So keep that. Yeah. In mind. Good, good, good. Um, yeah. So let, that sounds like a good starting point. So yeah. So we haven't even 
slid the little window open, but these are the things we want to keep in mind. So guys, we're at the doorway. This is a very challenging, complex scenario because there's a lot of possible reasons for vaginal bleeding. And now you need to be able to rapidly think, what are my most common causes? And, and this is one of those scenarios where age is going to be extremely valuable for you and allowing you to at least sort of narrow it down. Now, some things you always want to keep in mind. Number one, if we're dealing with a, um, a female who's postmenopausal, menopausal, postmenopausal, and there's vaginal bleeding, you usually want to assume cancer until you can rule that out. That's always important. Now, so let's just, let's sort of brainstorm here. We have cancerous reasons that we I just mentioned. What do you guys think would be, let's say, four or five common, right off the top of your head, cancerous reasons for vaginal bleeding? Endometrial, cervical, uterine, cervical, cervical, okay? All right. Okay. Good, 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 good. So a couple questions. Cervical cancer. Is it more common in someone who's older or is it more common in someone who's, let's say, in their mid to late 30s, early 40s? Cervical, cervical. Good. Cervical. So that's what, like I was saying, age. Cervical, you're usually going to think 35 to 45. Endometrial, we're thinking a little bit older, right? Endometrial mm -hmm. cancer, the average age is actually right around 60 years. So right away, if you see someone who's 67, you should never think cervical is my number one. You want to jump maybe to endometrial, right? What about vaginal cancer? What's the, where is it most common? Is it most common above 60 or below 60? Good. I saw one below, but yeah, above 60, right? Now, what about ovarian cancer? More common above 60, more common below 60. So yeah, we got a pretty pretty big mix here. So ovarian is usually mostly postmenopausal. You're gonna see half about about half of your ovarian cases when the patient's greater than or equal to 63 years. That's the most com that's the most up-to-date information. Rarely would you see ovarian in someone younger than 40. So I'm only going over these, you don't have to remember these right now, but I'm just trying to show you that there's very specific, you know, uh, uh, frames, time frames where Certain things are very common and certain things are not. So you always want to make sure you know these. And I'm going to give you guys a list of these uh, a little bit later. Um, so you can actually just review this stuff. I put, I've actually, me and Dr. Stavros collaborated here and we put together a pretty good little chart for you guys so you can study this stuff. Um, what about non-cancerous causes but someone who's postmenopausal? What would be a common cause? Good. It's very nice to see that they have the differential. Yeah, looks right. like you guys have been doing your work. One thing I didn't see anyone put, surprisingly, was trauma. One of those things where, right? What's that, Doc? Yeah, I think one, one, yeah, one. Someone put it. Here. Everyone always overlooks the the, the very uh, the most common thing. What's the most common cause of of an injury? Trauma, right? Bleeding. Yeah, so sure. always just keep that in mind, right? Um, any elderly abuse? I don't know. I wouldn't go there for vaginal bleeding. I would say though, uh, someone who's postmenopausal and who might have, um, you know, dryness, bleeding would be, I would think, very common. So that's always something you want to ask, and it, you, you you can't be embarrassed to say, you know, are you sexually active? Um, you know, how frequent are you having sex? Does it has, this is the first time you've experienced bleeding? Um, you know. Are you using anything additional? You can't be afraid to ask these questions because if you know you're too shy to ask the question, but in fact, you know, they were, I don't know, using something, who knows? You you want to make sure you get all the information because you know, a lot of times, for example, uh, rectal bleeding as well. Oftentimes I've never ever had a student, first time working with them, they ask if you engage in anal sex, but that could be a common cause of, of rectal bleeding. So you guys don't forget. Always think of the most likely th reasons first, and don't be afraid to ask those questions. Remember, you can ask anything, you just wanna make sure you do it properly, and you'll be in good shape.
course. So yeah, so guys, those are some of the most common cancerous, non-cancerous reasons. What about endocrine reasons? Give me your top two possible causes of vaginal bleeding related to the endocrine system. No, uh, Sal, I was giving rectal as a, um, oh, rectal, I see what you're saying. Rectal confused with vaginal bleeding. That's a very good point as well. Good, good, sure. good. So yeah, good. Okay, so we got thyroid. Thyroid, PCOS, beautiful. Also, another common thing that um, a lot of students fail to remember, which is, is very common too, is imagine you have a 35-year-old female who's on birth control and suddenly she stops using it. What happens? Withdrawal bleeding. So you always want to make sure you get the, um, you know, the, um, the medication changes and the time frames because that's a very common cause too. But it looks like you guys really have your stuff. Um, I'm very pleased with the answers. Uh, yeah, of course, abortion. Uh, that's definitely, um, we're going to get to that. So fertility reasons. What are your common causes of vaginal bleeding related to fertility? So for example, pregnancy and other things like that, right? Mm -hmm. IUD, absolutely. Ectopic miscarriage. Can you yeah. see can you see vaginal bleeding in a normal healthy pregnancy? Yeah. Good, good, good. Beautiful. All right, you guys are killing it today. Love it. Point on point. On point. <laughs> you guys it's like you guys what did you guys steal the show notes before? I know someone did because I saw it. But it's like you guys have the show notes. But this is good. It means you're you're studying. So it's important. Yeah. Um, before we get into the interview, a couple tips. Practice writing down your differentials for vaginal bleeding, both both pre and post menopausal, meaning before exam day. So, for example, if you're practicing with a friend, practice just writing down cancerous, non cancerous, um, endocrine, uh, medication, and, and then boom, 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 boom. Make sure you can just spit them out. So, if I said to you, tell me all the um, fertility related causes of vaginal bleeding, I want to hear boom, boom, boom all the medication causes, boom, 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 all the blah, blah, blah. You wanna be able to just spit that stuff out. Someone um, someone who's on this just uh, tried to text bleeding. It's not the keyword, nice try though. <laughs> um, practice, and this goes with every single, um, every single case. You wanna make sure that when you have complex issues like this, where it could be a variety of things, you wanna make sure that you can just spit it out real quick. That way when you start to ask your questions, you can narrow down what sort of section needs to be eliminated. If we're dealing with a 65 year old, all of a sudden our list of maybe 10, 12 things goes down to like three or four. So, yep. so it's very important. Um, and yeah. then, you know, Dr. Stavros made a, a point to make sure we wrote this on here. Write pelvic exam, write it on your sheet, circle it, underline it, so that you remind yourself at the end, when you tell the patient that you're gonna do some workups, that you include pelvic exam as part of your workup. So, you know, when you sit down, you tell them what's going on. I'm gonna run these tests. I'm also gonna have, uh, I'm gonna come back and we're gonna do a pelvic exam. Same thing if you have a rectal case, if you have a male GU case, we're gonna come back and do a, you know, a rectal exam, a vaginal exam, a pelvic exam. We're going to do a testicular exam, whatever it may be. Always include that as part of your closure when you are, um, you know, listing out the tests you're gonna do. Yeah. Okay. I mean, because also, guys, remember when you mention this, it might open up a conversation, like a question they might ask, right? Will you be gentle with me? Do you have to do it today? This is a, an exam where they're going to be challenging you from the minute you walk in to the minute you leave. So you want the challenge. Don't run away. Don't say, you know what, I don't want to bother them or I don't want to go that way. You have to do these things to get the points or else you won't get the points. That's all. Simple as that. So someone asked about what about coagulation disorders or von Willenbrand disease. Yeah, these things are possible, but remember, something like that's probably going to be identified much earlier. And so you're not going to get someone who's a lot older coming with a genetic disorder that late. It's highly unlikely, which the reason why I'm saying that is highly unlikely. Anything's possible. So you always want to know, stick to the most likely reasons. Don't start you know, thinking you know, outside the box when it comes to your diagnoses here. You just want to go with what's, what's the most likely reason and do I have that support? Perfect. Exactly. Um, when you say I'm going to order a pelvic exam, do you say you'll perform it later or another physician nope. will? You just yeah, you, know, you just say um, we're gonna we're gonna run some tests. One will include a pelvic exam, and then once we have our results in, um, we will get back in touch with you and we will talk about how to move forward. You don't even really have to give a time frame on it. Just say we are going to do it as part of the workup. 
because you know you, if you if you start saying time frames, you're just kind of making it a little more challenging on yourself. You know, no need to do that. Um, all right, so that was the doorway. Next up, we have the interview. Doc, you want to take this one away? Yeah. So, I mean, with, with the interview, as we mentioned earlier, I mean, it's very important to practice these type of questions you're going to be asking the patient to feel comfortable on exam day. So, you know, obviously the mnemonics, we're going to use OPDF, CS, AAA, okay, fine, onset, progression, duration, so on and so forth. And after that, because it's vaginal bleeding, we mentioned earlier, A, B, C, O. But really, you don't have to ask B because there is bleeding. You already know there's bleeding. So you do the amount, color, so on and so forth. And that's very, very important to quantify. Is it spotting? Is it bright red? Is it dark red? I mean, a lot, I see a lot of students, and it's a pet peeve of mine, they, they jump around uh, so much that they forget certain questions. Now, again, in reality, you can take as long as you want. On exam day, you only have 15 minutes, and that's for the whole the whole encounter. So why not practice your sequence, know it inside out, so you just spit it out, because if you know the sequence and you forget, let's say, a question, you're like, oh, I forgot to ask about color because I didn't hear myself say color. That's the whole point, right? That's what we train live to get this sequence built into your routine. Um, and after that, we have the LMP, RT, RT, VCS, PEP. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing we have to ask step by step by step you know the show notes will have everything written down as far as lmp menarche and everything listed one after the other if you don't know it you have to practice it so you do know it so you do feel comfortable on exam day to ask this of the patient um or they have it can you explain the mnemonic please the ones to use in the beginning so we mentioned opdf cs triple a mm -hmm. so obviously because there's vaginal bleeding so we have to ask amount color, consistency, clots, content, odor. And after that, you're gonna go into LMP, RTV, CS, PAP, to really figure out what's going on as far as you know regularity, her period, step by step by step, to gather the information. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to gather the info so you'll be able to then formulate the differential accordingly, okay? And then after that, what do we do? We have havoc. So now my question to you guys is, when do you ask these questions? like H for uh, atrophy therapy, hot flashes, atrophic vaginitis. I, my pet peeve also is when students just spit it out one after the other. That sounds robotic and that just sounds like it doesn't fit in anywhere, right? So when you are practicing, if you have, let's say, H for HRT therapy, maybe you wanna ask that under the medication question, right? Any recent medications? No. Well, any recent HRT therapy, hormone replacement therapy in the past? And then as far as AV, atrophic vaginitis, instead of just spitting it out, why not leave it towards the sexual questions? You know, when you are gonna be a little more intimate and sensitive and ask her, are you sexually active? And so on and so forth. You could throw in there, um, and I probably should ask the, 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 the group, how do you ask, well, I'll just say it. Atrophic vaginitis, you can't just say, do you feel you have any atrophic vaginitis? You would have to say, is there any itchiness, any dryness? any Thinning. discomfort, you know, Thinning. when you are having sex with your husband, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the whole point. You can't just spit out atrophic vaginitis. And then coronary artery disease and osteoporosis, well, isn't that part of past medical history? So when you ask about any recent, medic, any recent inf uh, illnesses diagnosed and she says no, then you could say, well, have you ever been diagnosed with coronary artery disease, osteoporosis? Have you had a recent DEXA scan? Those kind of things. So these are the mnemonics that we use to navigate through this encounter, but it does take time to practice. I mean, this is, I, I love this case just because even though people think it's easy, it really isn't because you have a lot of things to juggle. You have the individual, the female, you have all these different types of questions that you have, it has to sound natural when you ask these questions. You can't just throw them out one after the other because that sounds robotic, sounds like a checklist, and that could hurt your CIS score as well as your eyes. All right, what are they asking, Don? Can so for ask? H, can we just ask, have you noticed any hot flashes recently? Of course, that's perfect. I mean, that, not? No, hot flashes, is, is, is that's one of those things where everyone knows what hot flashes are, so that's absolutely fine. Yep, what? don't and overthink it, don't overthink it. You don't wanna say something like Doc said, you don't wanna say, have you noticed any atrophy in your vagina? That obviously doesn't make sense to 99.9% .9 of the population, but that's why you'd say, have you noticed any thinning, any dryness, any itchiness? But hot flashes, I mean, everyone knows the, the term hot flashes, right? So yeah, don't worry too much about that. 
And also, I mean, we've had a lot of uh, patients and students too who are older and younger. And a lot of women have told me, Dr. Stavros, be careful when you say hot flashes, because I know we know what it means, but sometimes women might be a little embarrassed about their last menstrual period. So, or when they hit, when they hit menopause. So either way, you have to ask it, be sensitive about it. And even if they get upset with you, it's part of the encounter. It's part of them being challenging to you. Don't take it personal. Don't get upset. Don't, you know, internalize and, you know, shut down. You have to say my apologies, Mrs. Jones. I didn't mean to offend you. It's just a simple routine question. When did you hit menopause or last menstrual period? Would be like the key phrase to find out was it 10 years ago, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, stuff like that. It's so you all, have to practice this a few times. It's always a good idea too to preface your um, your intimate questions with I'm going to ask you a few sensitive questions. Uh, please rest assured everything we talk about is confidential. I ask this of absolutely every one of my female patients. So would it be okay if we proceed? Remember, guys, I, I, I say this so often because it really, I really want to like, you know, make sure you, 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 you get the point here. You can ask anything, obviously within, you know, reason of the exam, but you can ask anything. You just want to make sure that you do it in the right way. So, for example, if you were to just split, spit out, hey, how many times have you had sex in the last year? Completely inappropriate. But if I say, if it's okay with you, I'd like to ask you a few sensitive questions about your sexual history. Uh, I ask this of everyone. It's just so I have a better idea of your overall health. Would it be okay if we proceed? How many times or with how many partners have you been sexually active over the last year? They're the same thing, but one sounds ridiculously inappropriate. The other, completely good, completely normal. I mean, whatever, completely good, normal. <laughs> like I said, three hours of sleep. So the way you ask things will dictate completely how strong your cis score is. So if Dr. Stavros goes in and he doesn't preface mm -hmm. things and he doesn't let the patient know that, you know, some of this might be sensitive and he asks the exact questions that I do, but I preface it with things like I just said, I show empathy, I show sympathy, I uh, change my voice when I'm getting into, you know, uh, challenging things. His score and mine could be complete polar opposites, even though we asked the same questions and got the same information. So like I said, guys, just make sure, don't don't agonize over, can I ask this, can I ask that, how do I ask it? Just make sure that you do it with that empathetic tone and you preface things, and it's gonna go so far. Like I said, you can ask almost anything as long as you preface it. And if, if you get to a situation where you're like, I don't know if this is something I should be asking, then preface it with, I have to ask you a few sensitive questions. And they'll be like, okay, I'm ready for it. Bring it on. What are you gonna throw at me? But if you just throw it out there, that's when you get into trouble. So keep it keep it keep that in mind. It'll it'll be your saving grace when you get to these real challenging things. Okay. I mean, but it's also guys, it's respect. Like when you go see patients in real life, right? You know, they even though you're a physician and you have to ask these questions, isn't it just nice to be like, you know, an ex question a little more sensitive, a little more personal gives them a heads up. Hey, listen, it's going to get a little more personal. That's all it is. That's all we're trying to say. Um, there's a question about safe sex. Well, if she says she's married, then there's no safe, there's no safe sex necessary, right? Because obviously she's married, she has a partner, but she might be divorced. That, she might be separated. She but, might be a widow. But ask, asking if she's married um, or if she's in a monogamous relationship is still technically asking about safe sex because we're assuming, right? If right. If you're in a monogamous relationship, we're just not going into the nitty gritty details, but you're still asking it, just not, like I said, not going to the nth degree because you you know she's monogamous, so you've asked, right? So, correct, um, correct. So someone asked, in terms of priority of questions relative to timing, would we lose a lot of points if we were to skip a few of these in order to speak more extensively about their symptoms? Um, you never wanna skip any of the questions or the physical exam maneuvers um, to talk about their symptoms because all of the things that you're asking are re related to their symptoms. Um, they might not be directly related, but I mean, if they're bleeding, so aside from amount, color, odor, onset, progression, uh, anything make it go away, anything make it worse, uh, when did they start the period, all these things are relevant to their symptoms. I mean, if someone started their period really late in life, that could change the potential direction of your diagnosis. If they started early, if they uh, have more sexual partners versus less, if they've had more kids, or if they've been on birth control, all of these questions, if you really think about it, play into your support. So you wanna ask those questions because you might be thinking, okay, I'm not gonna ask all these really detailed questions, but these detailed questions are your support. You want more of that support. So 
never like I've we always tell people don't look for an excuse to avoid asking questions or doing maneuvers just make sure that you're as efficient as possible and you can get through anything and just practice asking the questions you have to gather the data you can't assume I'll skip it because a lot of times we do our live training or live online students might jump around because they figure it's not necessary like ask about sleep or about exercise but let's say if you ask about sleep and they say, well, yeah, I sleep better now. What do you mean better now? Well, I sleep on a recliner. Well, what do you mean? Before, if I lay down, I start feeling like I'm choking versus let's say exercise. Oh, I, I don't exercise. Well, why not? Because when I do, my legs hurt, you know, chlorication. So you don't know what they're going to give you. Very, so very I personally, me and Dr. Paul, Dr. Paul and I, we're not risky. I would just work on my questions, ask them, gather the data. If it's negative, great. If it's positive, even better. That's all. That's all it is. Yeah, more than that. Good, good. Um, let's do a couple more questions, then we move on to the physical yeah, exam. Yeah. Uh, Daniela sure. asks, for young versus elderly patients, do we ask more invasively about their sexual history? Example, if elderly says she's not sexually active, ask about the number of partners versus if young SP says the same, ask more about partners. So it depends. I mean, there, that's one of those questions where a lot of things matter and I can't just say yes or no based on that alone. Because if you've got an elderly patient who is, let's say, experiencing vaginal bleeding, uh, you wanna know how many sexual partners she's had because it can help support your differentials. So yep. in any situation where you're dealing with reproductive systems, um, you should always get the details. Now, if she says she hasn't been sexually active since her husband died five years ago, okay, well, first of all, show some empathy, but you still wanna, you still need to get some details because again, this is a, a reproductive sexual case. You need that information. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna put let's say cervical cancer down as a potential differential, multiple sexual partners is support for that, right? So if she's only been with her husband for her whole life, you need to know those things. Same thing with a young person. Depending on what we're dealing with, um, you need to know that information too. So when it comes to sexual reproductive uh, GU, G, you know GU OB gyn questions, always get detailed sexual histories. Like if you go to your gynecologist, they're not just going to be they're not going to gloss over your sexual history. And if they do, they they're not very good um, because they want to know that information. So you especially should definitely not skimp on asking sexual history in these cases. The sexual questions are it's it poses problems for many students. It's a challenge because everyone has their own method, their own way in the yeah, hospital. Yeah, I know. I know. You know, we see it all the time. We see it all the time. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Christina, but not everyone has... understands monogamous meaning. Okay. Well, if someone says, "What do you mean by monogamous?" It means are you in a committed relationship where neither you or your partner is having sex outside of the relationship? That's all. If you ever come across a scenario here. Um, who asked is Bessie 141 if you ever come across a scenario where they don't understand something you asked then all you have to if they don't understand and you can see that say do you understand what that means if they say no explain it to them it's simple but most people do know what monogamous means especially in the United States um, I would think you'd be hard-pressed to find an adult who does not understand the definition of a monogamous relationship uh, I, I, it's it's common it's common language here so um, I mean, do you agree with that the, doc I mean I I think, no, no, I yeah, agree I think with you. That's and then, and uh, well, good point to bring up. If you, like he just mentioned in the rotation, he was a low educational level of patients. I get that. But this is CS exam. So in the CS exam, patients have all the information inside them and they have to expose the info. So if you start to bring in your experience from outside, like what Dr. Paul said, they don't understand, explain it to them. That's yeah, all it is. Yeah, it's simple. simple. Don't simple. overthink it, guys. Honestly, yeah, yeah. Do definitely. Really that's definitely a question where you're overthinking it. Because yeah. what else would you say? Uh, you could say, do you only have one partner? And then they say, well, yeah, right now, but I just started having sex with them last week. Oh, so you're not really monogamous. You had a partner. You know what I mean? If you, if you start to get too worried about how you ask things, then you just open up a can of worms and it gets even more complicated. So just, you know, keep it simple, guys. Keep it simple. To give you guys a tip, the CS exam is not going to trick you on that, meaning they, it's either going to be a marry. Or I'm divorced and I'm having sex with multiple people. It's gonna be one or the other. It's not gonna be like what you know what I mean. That's the whole point. It's not gonna be in reality. Well, they're gonna to lie to you. They're gonna withhold information. Here, it's gonna be clear. It's gonna be clean cut. Yeah. Either she's married, divorced, or out having a good time. That's right. all it is. Right. Okay. A couple more here, and then we'll get on to the physical yeah. exam. So we have Sally and we have Tuba. Sally says, "Can I ask, are you sexually active? With whom? Or describe the gender." So 
Very simple. I say, are you sexually active? They say, yes. I say, with whom? They say, my husband. I say, okay, great. So are you in a, you're in a monogamous relationship. Yes, move on. So they say, I say, are you sexually active? Yes, with whom? Uh, my boyfriend. Okay, so if they're, if they're, let's say, 40, you'd say, are you in a monogamous relationship? If they're 20, are you in a monogamous relationship? You always want to ask that because a 40-year-old who is having sex with uh, her partner and a 20-year-old, regardless, you want to ask if they're monogamous. And you can even ask that if they're married. I mean, I don't always necessarily think you have to because on the CS, if they say, I'm, I, I'm, I have sex with my husband, okay, great, I'm assuming you're monogamous. Um, unless it's something like uh, you think there's an STD, then you could ask. But if you're not thinking it's an STD, then just, you know, you can say, are you monogamous? They say, yes, great, move on. If not, okay, great, well, how many partners have you had? Um, yep. And then Tuba's question, can we skip menarche and regularity of cycle if someone is older or 65? I mean, you can, but you're gonna you're gonna lose points in your in your um, in your history. So it's up to you. If you want to skip it, you'll probably lose points because you don't have a thorough um, list of information. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna move on because otherwise yeah. questions will just keep rolling in. We'll get so you guys hold those questions if we didn't answer them to the end, and we will get to them. We do the so, rapid Q and A at the end. Good. Yeah. So physical exam. So guys, physical exam. Very basic here. The challenge of this case is your diagnostics and your interview. That's the big challenge here. Physical exams, super easy. Basic heart, basic lungs, abdominal, right? We can't actually do an OB guy in exam, so we're doing, we're doing abdominal. CS is actually pretty straightforward with complex cases with respect to the physical exam because you have a male GU, you have an OB guy, or you have a, a GI case, it's the exact same exam. You're going to do yep. the abdominal exam. Now, here is where the challenge lies though in the physical exam. There's four things you're going to do with the abdominal exam, right? You're going to you're going to percuss, you're going to palpate, you're going to auscultate, you're going to inspect. But you have to do it in a particular order. So I want you guys to tell me with those four things, what is the correct order? So we have palpate, auscultate, percuss, inspect. What do you guys think? I A P P. Well, there's two Ps, so tell me what's what comes first, percuss or palpate? Palpate or percuss? I have to pull it gets in and it gets mad if it's wrong sequence. Are you guys I get very mad. I'll probably hit the computer. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm gentle. Percuss palpate. And this is one of the exams where they have, they, they know they the know. SPs are they instructed know. by the USM organization to know the sequence. They need to know the sequence so they can grade you. Okay, so most of you got it right, but uh, I'm starting to see a lot of a lot of the P's backwards. You always want to percuss first and palpate last. Very simple reason why. When you're percussing, you're listening for a note, right? You're listening for a note based on what is where. If you start to put your hands into the abdomen and move things around, all of a sudden your percussion notes change, right? Yep. And that's not yep. what you want. So you inspect, obviously always inspect. You're looking for any abnormalities and always verbalize it. So I'm just gonna take a look at your abdomen. I'm looking for any scars, any bruises, any abnormalities. Then I'm going to auscultate. You're gonna listen, make sure you don't speed through it. Then you're gonna percuss, percuss third. And then the last thing you're gonna do is palpate. Just remember, you don't wanna move everything around before you have a chance to examine them. So the last yeah. thing you do is dig your hands in gently, of course. You can do superficial palpation. And if we were, you know, if we had, uh, if we were face to face, I would have you show it to me because most students do it incorrectly. I've seen students dig their fingers in the abdomen. You wanna use your whole palm and you wanna be gentle and move your hand around. You can just cover more area, it, it's gentler on the patient. And that's actually you know how you're going to properly maneuver around when you yeah. palpate. So let me just uh, go over some common mistakes that we see here. Um, auscultating over the gown, common, silly, that. huge loss of points. Just make sure yeah. you, you properly um, auscultate examine with the gown up. Another thing is improperly or incorrectly maneuvering the gown, right? Now, if you're, if you're checking the abdomen, you don't wanna lower the gown so that the chest and the abdomen are exposed. You wanna raise the gown, that way the chest remains covered and the abdomen only is exposed. Remember, you only wanna expose what you're doing and then as soon as you're done, cover it back up. It's a huge issue. Um, you know, just make sure that you are coming from the lower end all the way up. Another problem is performing the abdominal exam in the wrong sequence. Dr. Stavros said that's my pet peeve, one of many. Um, but the only reason why it's a pet peeve is because um, students 
don't take the time to understand why they do it in that particular order. But as long as you understand why, you'll get the correct uh, sequence, you'll be good to go, okay? Um, another thing that we see commonly with students is they forget to inspect. They just dive right into the auscultation and you'll lose a little bit of points there because you know you have to inspect. Whatever you're doing, you're always gonna observe first, right? You wanna make sure because if they have a bunch of cuts and bruises, you don't wanna just throw your stethoscope right on top of the, the, the lesions. That'll obviously cause pain. So very important that you inspect first and don't just raise the gown and look tell them what you're doing so i'm going to mr jones i'm just going to take a look at your abdomen i'm looking for cuts bruises always verbalize so if you don't have your hands physically on the patient we me and dr stavros always recommend tell them what you're doing so right now i'm just looking into your eyes right now i'm looking at your mouth i'm looking into your ear i'm looking at your abdomen always if you're looking tell them what you're doing real exactly. easy it's easy to forget to do that but it's very very uh powerful because it'll make sure you get those points and then the last thing that students forget is to pull out and push in the extension, the leg extension on the Ooh. table, right? So when the SP goes to lay down and you say, Mr. Jones, let me help you down. As you do that, you also wanna pull out the leg extension so that they're not just dangling over the edge, right? Their legs Horrible. are properly extended. Now, just a little side note, something that popped in my head. When you're, when you're doing the abdominal exam, if they are in pain, you can also have them bend their legs up. That'll soften the abdomen, makes it easier for you and less painful for them. Those are some common things that um, students typically screw up with the physical exam. Yeah, I mean, and, and you have to remember, if you're not practicing, I mean, obviously everyone's home alone right now, but I mean, when you're practicing, when the time comes, you have to practice these maneuvers. You can't just, you know, wait till the, the, the exam day to do it because you might get a little nervous the way they lay down, the way they sit up. I, I me as a patient, you know, sometimes they, they sit me up and then they don't pull, they don't push in the, the bed extension, and my legs are just like, you know, extended outwards, uncomfortable. Yeah. So you just got to practice that. That's all. You really do. Right. So we have a couple questions here. Yeah, a couple questions. Do we talk during the physical exam? Um, you can talk. You know, I don't have a conversation about something else, but you can discuss what you're doing. So I'm going to listen to your abdomen. And now I'm going to feel around your abdomen. Now I'm going to yep. tap your abdomen. Um, so verbalizing your finding. You don't have to verbalize your specific findings. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. But you know, when you're observing, you can say everything looks fine. If you see a cut, you know, how long have you had that cut? Or if you see a scar... Excuse me, why do you have that scar? That's okay. And uh, where'd you go with that from top, bottom, bottom, top? Which, how are you attacking these questions? Uh, I'm going from the top and then okay. moving down. Coming. Um, <laughs> for the abdominal exam, some doctors ask patients to bend their knees and others examine with flat knees. Um, like I said, when you bend the knees, okay. it, sort of, it sort of tenses things a little bit, which gives you more ability to examine them without pain. Because if, if their legs are flat, it, you know, in reality on the CS, it probably won't matter, but in real life, of course, if you have them bend the knees, you can you can feel around a lot easier, especially if they have a rigid abdomen. Yeah, so Yamira, should we pull up the gown? Obviously when they're laying down, let them pull up the gown, you bring up the drape because the legs can't be exposed. So it's kind of like a teamwork. They pull up the gown, you pull up the drape, so you expose the abdomen, that's all it is. Let them do more of the work. You don't have to really touch the gown, but. Yeah. yeah, you can't do anything over the gown, guys. That's our question further down. I know we do that in the hospital, like in the ER, ICU. Here, you have to expose to listen. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exam of skill. They're, they're, they're grading your technique, right? Not in reality, because in reality, we never take off the gown. We just keep moving and listen and keep going. So you have to do that or you get points off, that's all. Yep. Um, Sally asks, should I tell them everything looks normal after doing each part? Um, well, if, if everything is normal, then yeah, but if you examine their abdomen and, and they're in pain, then saying everything looks normal would be a bad idea. So, you know, if, if, if you listen and you say, okay, everything sounds fine, you look, everything looks fine, you can do that. That's not a big deal. But, you know, yeah. don't, don't overthink that one, Sally. That's another, you're overthinking it a little bit. Uh, John asks, for every CVS respiratory hearing sound, the stethoscope bell is touching the skin or the gown. Like we said, the skin, yeah. never the gown. That's a big no-no. So yeah. conjunctiva for anemia, you can, what are you going to look for? How are they going to present with uh, any, what, what are the findings? If there's any pallor, they might have, let's say, a little discoloration, let's say white. Remember, like if a person's anemic, let's say in a petite case. So you can look for it and basically see their fingers, their, their, their tongue and their eyes. Let them know what you're looking for, right? Pull your eyes down, look inside quickly to see if there's any, any pallor, any kind of discoloration or lack of color. That's all it is. Yeah. 
you won't see anything. But you right. can try that if you like. Right. Uh, Renee asks, what do you do about cold hands during the abdominal exam? I usually apologize or try to warm them up. Um, I mean, if you if you if you have really cold hands, you could always go and use soap and water, and you know, really ri rapidly rub them together using relatively warm water or sanitizer. Same thing. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, you can apologize. I mean, you know, is that a negative? I mean, it sucks for the patient who has to feel your cold hands, but I mean, everybody's different. They're not going to fault you for something you really have no control over. So, you know, I would say do your best to warm them up if you can. Um, because you're going to, of course, sanitize before you touch yep. them. That can help at least maybe alleviate some of the coldness. So keep that in mind. We had a student at Scleroderma. She used gloves because her hands were always cold. So yeah. she, and he told me, she goes, I'm going to use gloves. I'm like, okay. I told her use gloves because it's, you know, it's one less thing to worry. You don't have to open up conversation because right. then it just takes your time. That's right. All. all right. I'm going um, to, let's just answer one more and then we'll yeah, yeah. save the rest till the end. Sure, uh, sure. Amna asks, can you ask history questions and they're physical? Um, you shouldn't because if you do a good job of knowing your mnemonics, you should ask everything during the interview. But if you if you all of a sudden think, oh, shoot, I forgot to ask something, go ahead and, of course, ask it. But like we said in, in our, one of our previous webinars, don't say something like, oh, shoot, I forgot to ask you this. Now, can I ask you now? Don't let them know that you forgot. If you're just examining the abdomen and you realize um, you forgot to ask the quality of, of pain, for example, you, you know, let's say you're feeling around the abdomen. So Mr. Jones, like, how would you describe the quality? Is it sharp, dull? If you build it into the regular you know, flow, they won't know anything has really been forgotten and you'll be okay. Yeah. But if you get to a point where you have to ask five, six, seven things about um, from the interview during the physical, then you need to reevaluate um, your your strategy because that's too much. It'll be too obvious, and you can't just you know start taking big chunks of the interview and throwing it into the history. That's obviously a really really bad idea. Yeah. yeah. And Doc, you want to jump into the uh, closure? Yeah. So the closure, guys, if you follow us and you're always on our webinar, is the same step process. One, provide your differentials, one, two, or three. It depends. Don't think every case has three. Some might have one, some might have two. Disclaimer, if you only put one, be careful. If it's wrong, you'll fail the case because then whatever you put give to the patient, you're going to put on your note. So ideally, you want to put two, if not three. Next step, you want to tell them what kind of test you're going to run, obviously based upon what differentials you're choosing. Um, and then do they have any questions? Um, Obviously, uh, we have a couple of challenging questions kind of come up right now. It's not guaranteed they're going to ask you a question. They can ask you a question anytime in the encounter. As once you walk in, right before you're about to leave, you touch that doorknob, boom, they can ask you a question. That's the challenge of the CS. They're going to throw questions at you at any time and see if you can handle it. So you want to yeah. bring some people on board, Doc? Yeah, sure. Uh, if you guys, if anybody wants to volunteer, um, go ahead and put your hand up. And we'll While you bring do you that, in. let's see. If you wear gloves, do we need sanitize? No, you don't have to sanitize. Obviously, you have gloves on. Um, red flags, guys. A lot of red flags about this case. It's kind of hard to answer in one one answer. Poof, um, a lot of red flags. There's a, there's there's, there's many, endless red flags. I mean, first is the differentials, and on top of that, it's the cyst complaint you could fail the ice and the cyst very easily in this kind of case. So it's kind of a tricky answer. It's you can't answer in one line. All yeah. right, all um, right. Let's bring someone on. I'm going to bring on. Stacy. Hey, Stacy. Stacy. Hey, Stacy. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Very good. All right. So, uh, challenging question. Let's. Um, were you here earlier when I when I gave you the uh, challenging question about the female doctor? Uh, yes. Okay. So I'm a female patient. Let's pretend you're a male doctor, and I say, Doctor, um, I'm uncomfortable with a male doctor. So can you please bring in a female doctor for me? How would you respond to that? I probably respond with, um, you know, uh, Miss So So and So. If it's all right to ask, I was wondering um, why you're uncomfortable with a male doctor, and uh, perhaps I can do something to make you a little bit more comfortable if we don't have a female staff member available. Okay, so yeah, that's a good start. So let's say I say I'm just not comfortable with a man seeing me naked if you're not my husband. So how would you respond to that follow up? Um, I would say. Um, <laughs> I hear your concern. Let me see if I can try and go get someone. I don't think I would necessarily ar like argue with the person because I, you know, sure. that's her uh, belief, and I feel like that's sure. difficult to. It's a tough one, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very tough. 
Um, Dr. Stavros, you want to jump in or you want me to take this one? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, honestly, guys, at the end of the day, you can't walk out and get somebody else. And we see a lot of doctors do this. They go, right. you know, Miss Smith, I'm, you know, I am, I'm board certified. I'm, I'm uh, very trained and I have a, 20 years of experience. That's not the right answer. And I'll tell you why it opens up more doors for them to respond to you. All you have to say is Miss, Miss, Mrs. Jones, I do understand that you want a female physician. Unfortunately, all the physicians are occupied right now. Everyone's very busy. I'm the only doctor right now is available. If you don't mind, I'll sit down, ask you a couple of questions. And if you still feel uncomfortable a little later on, I'll do my very best to find another physician. At that point, they won't do anything. They'll say, thank you. You'll sit down and they'll open up and start telling you why they felt a little uncomfortable. But no, no, re no more reactions to say, tell me why you feel uncomfortable. That opens up more doors. And that time, that clock in the room is going to be against you. So this is the CS world we're talking about. That's where you have to find certain ways to kind of answer them without having them answer back to you. You know what I mean? That makes any mm -hmm. sense? It, yeah, and, and when when you actually said that to me, that's when I asked you that follow up that was basically impossible for you to really like, what can you possibly say if I say I don't want any man behind, besides my husband to see me naked at that point, you're kind of stuck. Right. So um, this is super, super challenging. And um, but Dr. Stavros is right. It's situational and you have to think, what can I say for the CS to satisfy them? to the point where I've given them an answer that makes sense for the CS so that we can move on. Because yeah, if you if you sort of open these doors and you get to a point where they've said something to you that you really can't argue, such as, as I just did, then you're really in a bind and that can put you in a very tricky situation where uh, your CIS score diminishes. So, um, and if you walk outside, very challenging. Guys, very challenging. The yeah. door, walk out, mm -hmm. the case is over. So. Respect the wishes, yes, in reality, CS world, it's a challenge. So you have to handle it this way or else it's going to be, um, you know, time consuming. That's all. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. does, that, does, that, Aunt, does that make sense or are you still a little confused on that one? No, it makes a lot of sense. I think like as soon as you asked the second question, I knew like there was really no way out. Right. <laughs> and, and, if that makes sense. Yeah, and it, honestly, it's sort of like a game of cat and mouse, right? If you think about it, like you want to give them a satisfactory answer, but you don't also want to give them that inch where they can sort of sneak in and be like, all right, I'm going to just like destroy you right now and put you in a scenario where you have no legitimate answer for me. So yeah, always yeah. want to just think, how can I answer this? for the CS so that I can get to the next step. And oftentimes it's not what you would do in reality, but it's what you have to do just to get to the next situation. Now, one thing I can tell you is we always ask students challenging questions that are far beyond what we think they'll actually encounter so that you're overly prepared. So in this scenario, Stacy, that's probably as challenging of a question that you might ever get and I don't even think I've ever heard of anyone actually saying it, although I can't be 100% sure. But you want to over prepare with real challenging questions like this. So um, hopefully that at least answers your question and gives you a little bit of something to think about when you're answering that type of question. Um, and on Thursday when we do the challenging questions, hopefully you come back and we can bring you back on. Maybe we'll throw it to you again and we'll see. We'll let you think about it for a little bit and uh, see how it goes. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Stacey. All right, have and, a good one. You know, guys, and you have to remember, in the hospital, in the clinic, you're going to you obviously respect her wishes. You're going to say, okay, you yeah, know, I'll sure. step right outside. I'll be right back, Mrs. Jones. I'll find a female doc, a female physician. Or you would get a nurse to come in with you. That's the protocol. Yes. But here, there's no nurse outside. You can't leave the room. You can't do any of that. So this is where the CS can challenge you to figure out how would you answer that kind of question. So yeah. just keep an eye on the physician. Okay, should we bring, let's bring someone else on. Yeah, sure. I'm going to bring on, let's see, let's see. Second question is good. I like that one. Uh, okay, the, second, the challenging question, the second one here? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, and, and to, go ahead. And to re repeat the answer, guys, basically stating that mirror, mirror the question, mirror the statement. I know that you want a, 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 a female physician. Unfortunately, everyone's very busy right now. I'm the only doctor right now is available. That's all. And just, you know, uh, diffuse a situation, say, if it's okay with you, I'll sit down, ask you a couple of questions. We'll do a quick physical exam, nothing invasive. And then later, if you still feel uncomfortable, we'll, you know, we'll see who, who's available. Yeah. And that's the whole point. She'll say, 
I have vaginal bleeding. I feel uncomfortable talking to a male, per, you know, male physician. Yeah. And then after that, she'll be fine. That's okay. all it is. All right, Doc. I'm going to bring someone on, and yeah. I'm going to let you please, handle please. this because I have to run to the bathroom. Uh, yeah. I'm going to bring on uh, <laughs> Faye, Faye George. I'm going to bring Faye okay. on. Let me unmute her. And then I have I have to join you after. Go ahead. That's fine. Hello. <laughs> Let me see. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you, Doc? All right. Go for it. <laughs> I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Good. 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 So, all right. So, if I, so you're the physician and I'm the patient, Mrs. Smith, whatever the name is, and then I ask you, and I'm 65 years old, and I'll say, is it normal, doctor, for a woman my age to be bleeding like this? Um, thank you, Mrs. Smith, for your concern. I do understand why this is distressing to you. Um, from what I can tell from your history and physical, um, I would say that it isn't normal for you to be bleeding like this. There can be many causes for this. Um, of course, I would need to run some blood tests and imaging to get a final answer. Would that be okay with you? Good. So I like the approach because that's the truth, right? I mean, usually it's not normal. You can't say, yes, it is. And you want to say, it, it's kind of not, right? But expect the, the patient might jump back and say, start getting upset with you, right? It's not, she's not upset with you. She's upset the fact that now it's abnormal. So I love that, that the answer. I would just, for CS, I would just kind of not, not, you could just say, you know, there's many causes of vaginal bleeding. Some are, you know, abnormal because, for example, trauma, right? Trophic vaginitis, it's, it's, it, it can be caused due to no lubrication and obviously having a sexual history. So that's why that kind of an answer is great. I love how you approached it. If for some reason she bites back and she gets upset because now she looks, you know, more concerned, more, um, uh, you know, uh, upset, then you have to challenge that whole scenario moving forward, right? So just be careful with that. So I like your answer. But I personally, for me, I, I, I stay away from saying it's not normal because then they might get upset. So I kind of not saying I lie to them. I just basically say, you know, Miss Jones, there's many causes of vaginal bleeding. I have to ask you a couple more questions and do a physical exam to really know what the what the cause is. You know, some some could be normal, some could be not. So I kind of gave her everything without saying, hey, it's abnormal. Because at that point, moving forward, she might be upset the whole time. It's hard to navigate through the encounter when she's sad. She's not responsive and she actually looks concerned, right? Because if you told me Stavros, it's not normal, I'm not going to be cooperative. I'm going to start thinking what's wrong with me, right? So okay. I know I love the answer and I know a lot of books say, tell them it's abnormal, but then do they tell you how to handle the case moving forward the next seven, eight, nine minutes when the patient's really upset with you? So don't lie. I'm not saying guys, don't, don't say it's not, don't say it's normal, just you know, basically neutralize and say there's many causes of vaginal bleeding. Some are normal, some are not. So you kind of answered her without saying, hey, what you have right now, it's abnormal. Because it's hard after that, it's really hard. Okay, Mad Doc? thank you. My pleasure, no, that's it. Dr. Paul. Yes, all right, thanks. Let me, let me just uh, remove Thank you, thing. Doc. I'm gonna jump out a second. Yeah, I'll bring one more person on. Um, let's see, I'm gonna bring on JT. JT, let me unmute you. JT, how you doing? Yeah, hi, I'm good, thank you. Good, good. All right, you're ready for a challenging question? Yeah. Okay, so patient says they have vaginal bleeding. They say, is it safe to continue having sex? How would you respond to that? Uh, vaginal bleeding, what? Oh, sex, okay. Yep, so let's say it's a 60-year-old uh, female with vaginal bleeding. Okay, see, uh, yes, I understand your concern about having sex when you have a vaginal bleeding, but uh, uh, the point is it's not uh, safe and it's not, uh, you You may feel painful also when you have uh, sex when during the bleeding. So I would suggest uh, we'll just have some examination, run some tests, and then look out what is the problem exactly, and then we'll see whether the uh, going participating in sex would be safe or not. Okay. Then we can go ahead from there. Okay. Do yeah. you have any questions? No, that sounds good. Yeah, I think there's I think there's two schools of thought here. One is to say, you know, as long as it's not causing you any pain, I don't see any reason why you can't have sex. The other is to say, you know, you may as well hold off until we run some tests and figure out what's going on. In reality, unless they're in pain, I don't think there's any reason to say you shouldn't. Um, obviously, until you've run some tests, like you don't want them to go and have sex and then come and get some tests run. But 
you know, it's not a big deal to say if you're not in pain, that's not that's not really a big issue. Um, so I think you could go either way, really. Um, but I think your response was great. So uh, if you use that, I don't see any problem with that whatsoever. I heard it from over there too. So yeah. So yeah. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Doc. And again, guys, in reality, you can say whatever you want, but this is a 15 minute encounter. So for me personally, if I'm taking the exam, I'm not going to lie, but I don't want the patient to be upset. So I'm not going to lie to them. I'm just going to neutralize the situation and say, you know, there's many causes of dot, dot, dot. Yep. So right now it's too yep. early to tell. And then later tell them when you have more findings that it is abnormal and yeah, it's cancer or something versus maybe it's just a uh, AV. That's all. Yep. <clears throat> um, yeah. So guys, if you, uh, if you kind of enjoyed like this coming on and doing this, that's what we're going to be doing Thursday for about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, and then, you know, once they, once you've answered the challenging question, say, do you have any other questions for me? If they say no, okay, great. And then say your goodbyes and then you'll be in touch shortly. And that's all you need to do. So with every case, the workup, same approach, right? They need to be warranted and they need to just rule in or rule out your differentials, right? And one thing students always ask, is the order of the workups important? Uh, no, you just want to make sure you include them. So you don't have to have like most expensive, the least expensive, most or least invasive to, you know, that doesn't matter. Just list what you need to rule in or out your differentials. Don't go overboard. Remember, always be economical. Think economically. If you can, or if you can figure something out with an x-ray, don't order an MRI. Just because an MRI might be, uh, you know, a better picture, doesn't mean it's the necessary test. So always make sure you're thinking, how can I save the hospital money? How can I be least invasive with the patient, right? Always minimize the uh, invasiveness always minimize the cost, of course, if it still gets you the information you need. So <clears throat> just a couple important tips just to sort of end here before we answer some questions. Number one, and Dr. Stavros mentioned this at the beginning, you need to focus on empathy and sympathy. Anybody who comes in with vaginal bleeding is probably extremely concerned. You need to come in and walk through that door with your empathetic hat on from the start, right? Don't walk in trying to make a best friend. Walk in assuming they're upset. And then if they're not, okay, then you can maybe be a little more jovial. But go in realizing that you need to be very empathetic and sympathetic here because most people are very concerned. Number two, practice those mnemonics. The, I, the OB mnemonics are probably the, the set of mnemonics that I, I hate the most because there's a lot to remember. LMP, RDV, CS, PAP, ABCO, Havoc, on top of OPD, FCS, AAA. That's a lot. So make sure you know those. Make sure you can re regurgitate them at a moment's notice in your sleep because you don't want to be sitting there trying to figure out what they are. It seems like most of you guys probably know them based on how you responded earlier, so that's fantastic. Uh, tip three, uh, so you don't screw up, practice your abdominal exam. One of the biggest challenges th with the abdominal exam is... Uh, maneuvering the gown. I see students screw that up all the time. Another is uh, the way you do the physical exam, specifically the uh, palpation. One of the things that I always hate the most about you know, doing these types of cases in person is that students always dig their fingers, like I said, into the abdomen. You're not feeling anything this way. Use your hand flattened. The patient will thank you for it and you'll actually get a lot more information because you're feeling with your whole hand, not just your fingertips. Imagine how many places you have to feel with your fingertips versus just laying your hand flat. Keep, keep that in mind. Because um, like Doc said, the SP knows the sequence. So if you're getting it wrong, you will lose some points. Okay. Um, sure. So don't, one thing students always forget to do when they're practicing with their friends is the gown maneuvering. Practice maneuvering the gown with your friends. It'll save you a huge headache on the real exam. Challenging questions, practice, 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 practice. You need to practice so many challenging questions to the point where it doesn't matter what crazy thing someone throws at you, you have a strategy. And if you guys caught the IG live the other day, we actually outlined the four step strategy in great detail and showed you guys how to apply it to, you know, uh, can I have medications? Do I have cancer? Do I have this? Do I have that? The four step strategy is extremely important. And we're actually going to provide you with a link on the show notes to the YouTube video that I made. On a whiteboard, I outlined the four-step strategy and gave you guys detailed breakdowns of how to implement it. You can't go into your exam without being 100% confident in your ability to answer challenging questions, okay? Um, and guys, the last one here, 
is to, and this is what we said at the very beginning, make sure you practice your differential list for this case. You've got cancers, you've got non-cancers, you've got endocrine, you've got medication, you've got fertility issues. You have so many things you need to make sure you keep in mind here that it, you just can't afford to not go in, being able to just rattle that stuff off, off the top of your head. Super, yeah. super important, okay? So let's do this. I'm gonna set the alarm for 10 minutes. There's a ton of questions. So if you guys have any more questions, go ahead and you can start now asking them. And then when the 10 minutes is up, we'll cut off the questions, we'll answer whatever's left, and then that will be it. So let's go up a little bit here. Let's see. Um, uh, is it necessary to always have three? Like I mentioned, mentioned, guys, you don't have to put three. You only have to put whatever you think is uh, relevant. If you have three differentials, we also have to support them, right? So you're just not going to uh, – well, I don't want you to just put three because you have to put three and just throw a third one in just to fill some space because if you do that, your ice will go down. I guarantee that because you can't just guess a differential without supporting it. So some have one, some have two, some have three. Can't tell you which ones are which. Or, are you starting from the bottom? No, no. I was up here. I was trying to get something from the top. What time are you at? What's the time stamp on your questions? Um, three oh. So it was three oh seven. Okay, I'm down to three forty seven. So okay. Oof. Yeah. Okay. So I think you probably uh, might have. Yeah, if you go down to three forty seven, sure. we're we're on three four three forty seven p.m. or maybe two on your end for Yamira. Oh, Should we turn the head eyes while the patient pulls up the gown? So I've 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 answered up to there, I believe. Um, no, you don't need to turn your head while they pull up the gown. They're not exposing anything except for their abdomen. Do we need to bring up the gown or let the patient do it? Always recommend that you guys have the patient do it. Just instruct them to either lower the gown, raise the gown, whatever you need. That way you don't you know, have to fumble with anything and you don't put yourself at risk of accidentally grazing something that you might not want to graze. You know, It's very possible. That had it, a million students have grazed me <laughs> accidentally and that's why I tell them just have me do it and then you don't have to worry about it it's simple Perfect. so that's... Yakini should we semi flex the legs we answered that one yep next one on the CV CVM, how many lung fields do we listen to obviously in the back you have four spots you can do back and front it depends if it's a lung case or not if it's not a lung case you just do the back and move on because I mean you're going to waste a lot of time right also for sure. the front and the back too much. what are you trying to listen to there's no consolidation so Absolutely. I mean, what you're trying to find, right? So. Absolutely. Um, um, you know the next one? Yep. Yeah. Should we auscultate all four quadrants? Yes. Should we ask for weakness due to bleeding? Yes. Someone Glove. just someone just wrote gloves. <laughs> Whatever you want. Gloves, water, sanitizer. sanitizer. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know what you're asking. You're probably I mean, just responding to someone like who asked something. I can sanitizer. <laughs> if you want to use gloves, sure. It doesn't make a difference. Oh, the next question. Do we use sanitizer or wash hands with what? If you wash hands with water, you have to use the soap, right? The lather. Yeah. So you have to put the soap in your hand. You have to wash your hands. You have to get the towel. It takes about, about 15, 20 seconds. You can't fake it, yeah, right? So no, hand no. sanitizer for me, Dr. Paul, is nice and quick. And then move into the physical it's, exam. Yeah, it's, now, it's, post-corona, we don't, we don't know what they're going to say. Until then, that's what we're doing as of right now. Right. And post-corona, we don't know. And they'll let us know. They'll tell you. So you won't walk in your exam clueless. They will let you know, so don't freak out about that. Please, um, yeah. I would assume that you know things will probably go back to normal once they open the doors. When that will be, who knows? So yeah. Zara asks, if we run short short on time, then we can only auscultate chest for respiratory and CVS exam and do only focus exam like abdominal in this case. Um, Zara, if you're running short on time, then it means you need to focus on improving your interview skills and your efficiency because there's no reason to run short on time. So there's just no excuse, no no reason. If you're running short on time, that means you didn't practice your efficiency and your strategy and your interview skills strong enough or, or, or hard enough during your prep. So that should never happen during your real exam. And we've never put, sent a student out to their exam after working with them where they couldn't finish any case. And by the, the last day, we're throwing insanely hard um, memory loss cases where we're throwing every challenge at them in the book and they're still able to finish. Now, yeah. you know, if you're getting a crazy patient who's challenging you every which way, that might just be the case. That just might be the case. So don't worry, but never skip something so that you can, uh, you know, finish in time because you just can't do it. So anything red flag that, that can cause whole failure, honestly, wrong differentials and the patient note right there. Because if you give the sure. patient the wrong differential, or differentials and you walk out, no one's gonna tap your shoulder and say, hey doc, it's wrong. 
So you go type it on your note, then you get your points down in the room, points down in your note, and you fail the case just like that. So you can't just throw out differentials. You have to put the ones that you can support. That right there would say straight failure. Plus, yeah. if you don't sanitize your hands, that's also, that was an old myth back then, but who knows. Yeah. Um, um, all right, let's let's be a little more efficient here. So yeah, let's do this. I'm going to, let me answer a chunk of questions, then you can answer sure, a chunk. Sure. In yeah, the meantime, cool. um, so we don't forget while you we got you guys here, uh, I know a lot of you signed up for our six week uh, $100 step to CS prep special uh, that we're running for the COVID. We've had so many people ask because we sold out if we can open up another section. So we actually did. And you can actually uh, still get in. We're still taking registrations for that. Six weeks pre made course plus once a week, you're going to jump on live with us and do webinars like this. We're going to train you from top to bottom. Dr. Starvos will put a link at the bottom for you guys. Um, and like I said, on Thursday, so don't forget, we're going to do the um, challenging question interactive webinar and we're going to use the CS survival guide. We're going to pull all of our questions from that. There's 230 plus questions. So if you don't have that yet, you probably should get that because just the amount of challenging questions, the amount of cases, 120 plus cases, uh, that's cssurvivalguide.com. You should get that, especially now. Uh, because it gives you enough cases to do a couple a day up until your exam. So I got that out of the way. So go ahead and throw those down, Doc. Let me answer a few and then I'll let you they're do a few. Up, they're up there. So Jan says, it's heart, lungs, abdominal exam for complete. Basic heart and lungs and then your abdominal exam, yes. If we wear gloves, do we need to sanitize still? Nope, don't have to do that. Just do one or the other. Uh, Amna, all right, got it. Thanks, good. JT's waving his hand. John M, while adjusting the gown, uh, while the SP is adjusting, exposing or coming back, do we have to lend them our hand and help or do we stand back and wait? So you, if you're doing, let's say, uh, the chest exam, you're going to untie it and then let them do it. And then when, when they've done that, then you can move forward with the exam. Um, but yeah, if they're, if, they're, if they're raising the gown, you should actually be raising the lap towel or the lap um, blanket so that they can pull their gown up. So there's always something you need to be doing. And... Uh, we actually, in our physical exam videos in the uh, the six week course, we cover all that. So if that's something you're concerned about and you're in the program, uh, which John, I think you might be, you'll get training for that. So don't worry. Uh, A.E. Tayo, can I perform a general physical exam? Eyes, palate, jaundice, lymph node, finger, calf, PLD moving for a focus exam. Um, you don't have to do that for every single case. Um, why would you palpate lymph nodes, uh, finger, calf, pedal edema, if it's not related to the complaint. So don't get don't get too ahead of yourself there. Uh, just focus on the basic heart and lungs. Like like we talked about though, if, if there's weakness, you can check for a pallor, right? Because if there's if they're losing blood or you know there's some other underlying problem, you can always do that. But just don't go crazy with all the additional things like checking the calves. I mean I don't see why you would want to need to do that. Yeah. Most difficult questions to answer in pregnant patients, am I going to lose my baby? That's a good one. I'm going to write that down and we're going to talk about that. On Thursday. On Thursday. Because I'm going to lose my baby. That's a great question. Uh, who asked that? NGC. Um, if I if we go through this, we'll waste everybody's time because it'll take forever. So, um, But come back Thursday and I will bring you on. Let me just write yep. your name. NCG. 80022. You're going to come on and answer that. For slow typers, can we write just two differentials in all 12 cases? Well, if you have three differentials, then no, absolutely not. You can't just leave off a differential because you're a slow typer. Anusha, here's the, the magic secret, the magic bullet to solving that problem. Focus on your typing skills. You have a minimum of 45 days from now until the first student takes their CS. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know that that's going to be that early. You can turn into a phenomenal typer in 45 days. Go to Google, type in free typing lessons, spend two to three hours a day on your typing skills. I guarantee you if you do that every single day from now till then, you will not have to worry about being a slow typer. Guys, there's no excuse for being a slow typer, especially right now. You can't go and take your exam. You have all the time in the world. You might have kids, sure, you might have other responsibilities, but if you can't squeeze out one to two hours of typing and working on a skill, to improve your chances of becoming a doctor, then you're probably going to be in trouble. So keep that in mind. Work on your typing skills, that will help you, okay? Um, thank you for everything, respect her wishes. Is it okay to say I can ask a female nurse to be here in the room with me if it makes you more comfortable? Uh, yeah, but the problem is if she says, please, yeah, let's get a nurse in here. 
how are you going to find a nurse? Mm-hmm. So Nisha, that's a challenging one. That's kind of like what I was talking with Stacy. It's like you can't say something that opens you up to a to a scenario where you're cornered and you have no answer, right? It's like if you're doing a debate with someone and they're very good, they're going to slowly and meticulously get you into a corner where your argument no longer makes any sense. And you don't want to put yourself in a situation where everything you say doesn't make sense. Because if they say, please bring in a nurse, you'll be like, uh, actually, I don't have one. Then what? You look kind of like an idiot, right? So don't ever say anything that if they say, yes, I want to do that. And you're like, oh, crap. I just talk, walk myself into <laughs> like a fail on this case. So anyway, I took a few. Doc, you want to jump in and take a few? Yeah, sure. What's the time frame there? So Tuba at 356, we can say that we'll only do the abdominal exam. You see that one? All right, let me see. 256, my time. Um, Yes, yes, yes. Okay, 256, okay. All right, let's see. Still confused. Okay, abdominal cancer. I can understand your concerns and I assure you, okay, basically how addressing the situation with the female patient and I'm still confused. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, can I answer that? I will just have an interview and brief physical. Again, guys, yeah, I mean, you just got to practice the, the verbiage so you make the patient feel comfortable and you address their concern and pretty much make them understand that, hey, listen, yeah, I understand that you don't want to, uh, you want a female physician, but I'm the only one available. Um, let's see. Uh, what if you don't have more questions? And she asks this at the end of the closure. Well, that's the challenging part. I mean, if if she brings up anything at the closure, you have to be able to address it and neutralize it. So uh, if I don't have any more questions and she asks this at the end of the closure, it can happen. Usually it's at the beginning, but if, they, if, if, to, if she even does that. Could you please provide what kind of abbreviations other than the list of your SMLE? Guys, that's a lot of information that we can't go through it right now. It's an impossible um, thing to answer too, Doc. Because we nobody knows. That. No one knows exactly. What, so what's our rule of thumb? You want to tell them? So pretty much the rule of thumb is stick with the, stick with what's on the list and actually type out everything. I mean, if you're going to use some abbreviations, it has to be common abbreviations. I would just stick with the list. Don't come up with your own abbreviations because if you're, if you're used to that and they're not, plus with their artificial intelligence, the computer software, they don't uh, recognize that, they're going to dock you points. So stick with the list and keep typing to make sure that you're able to type the words out. That's all. Anything else, Doc? No. Um, yeah, no, I agree. You know, it's it's one of those things where it's like, you know, a lot of students want to abbreviate everything, but I always say, you yeah. know, feel free to abbreviate outside of the list, but what you're risking is, first of all, it's an AI system now. If they, if they, the US Emily decides that we're not going to accept the abbreviations that aren't on that list, and AI doesn't recognize it, your patient note might go down the toilet. And guys, are you willing to risk your entire future because you were you didn't want to write out a few full words? If you the the rule is just if it's not on that list, just write it out. I mean, I would it would just kill us to hear that you failed, and then because we've seen this before, students have failed ICE, and it's like, what happened? They're like, well, I just abbreviated everything. What do you mean you abbreviated it? Well, I just didn't have time. You, you probably I, failed I, to know because you abbreviated too much. You just have to stick to that list, guys. Unfortunately, yeah. there's no, there's nothing great we can tell you. You just have to suck it up in this instance because that's like the only thing that we can say to you that will guarantee that you'll be success, successful is to stick to what they tell us. It's just, it sucks, but that's just how it is, you know. And, and honestly, I know you guys are probably thinking, you know, what we're saying and what, what, what actually we mean. Well, this is based upon our training. So I've seen students on day one come to me, come to Dr. Paul, and they're not that great typers, right? But, you know, they're typing five, 10, 15 notes a day for three days. If it's a live versus live online, five days, if it's obviously live online. And in five days, we've seen students literally switch 180 because they're typing five, 10, 15 notes a day. You have all the time in the world to do it right now. I mean, every note's 10 minutes, right? So why not spend an hour in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, an hour in the evening to type to a point where you are perfecting the note. So um, so we know it works. We see it. Use condom in case of vaginal bleeding. I, I mean, I personally would tell the patient not to have any sexual practice until we know what the cause is, but it's up to you how you want to handle it. Either way, I, I want to know what, why she's bleeding before they could refrain you know, or go back to having sex. Um, thank you so much. Can you please give the link? Okay, it's further down or further up. I, I'll put it up again. What are they asking the for? I'll put it in again. Yeah, the challenging question YouTube. I put it in earlier. Uh, it's in the show notes as well. But uh, let's see. Challenging question. Oh, thank the you. YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, we will provide that. Okay, let's see. Thank you for the challenging questions. Yeah, guys, we'll definitely let you know about that. Guy in the lecture, <laughs> it is. Is it necessary to always have three? Like I mentioned, it's one, two, or three. You have to follow the findings. It's what the patient gives you, but it's actually what you're gathering and you have to support it. Don't throw a differential down and have no support because let's put it this way. If you put down three differentials and you leave the findings empty, you'll fail because they need to be proven. You need to prove to whoever's grading the system, the, the notes, the, the note, the, the, the computer software that you are choosing one, two, and three for X, Y, and Z reasons. So there's no rule because I've had many students like Dr. Paul come to us after they failed and they failed the ice miserably because they put down three in every case. Again, I'm not saying not to do it, but just don't throw it in just to fill the space. You have to have findings to provide enough evidence. So show notes, I put the information in there already. Um, yep, I just did it again too. So if you scroll to the bottom, you'll find them. How we ask about regurgitation from patients. Can we use this word in history? Regurgitation mean like, well, like a uh, regurgs, like you know, reflux, acid reflux. Obviously, you know, any kind of like burning sensation, any kind of metallic taste, any kind of like, um, like basically say any kind of reflux. You can simply say that. And then can we use this word in history? Well, yes, because you're writing the note to a physician, to a computer system that physicians are obviously reading over all this the computer system. You're not writing a note to a patient. So the chief complaint is obviously in the patient's words, but after that, it's all medical terminology because the patient's not reading your note nor is there an actor reading your note. It's a, now it's a software system. Prior to that was a physician. So you have to be, use medical terminology or your notes will suffer and the score goes down on the ice. Let's see. Um, in workups, possible MRI, if it's warranted, sure. Remember, you can't just you know, like throw out uh, workups. It has to be supporting your differentials. If it's not supporting, if it's too invasive, it's too expensive, be careful. Let's see. Okay, challenge your question link is there on CV. How many lung fields? We talked about that already, guys. You could do front and back in reality, but here it's not enough time. Go to the posterior, four spots. If you want to do six, go for it. But again, the time is against you. Be careful. Link to notes. We have put up there already. Do we check hepatosplenomegaly? You can. And the abbreviation I will use for that, it's HSM or write out the whole word. You check the liver and spleen, but don't spend too much time doing that because you won't find anything the patient's normal, unless you are palpating and they say, oh, it hurts or it feels a swollen, then they'll lead you into being enlarged. Um, how to comfort a patient that's crying? Well, you tell me. First of all, I would stop everything I'm doing, address the fact that they're crying. You know, Ms. Ms. Smith, I see that you're crying. Is everything okay? Can I get you a tissue? You know, would you like to talk about it? You know, what can I do for you right now? I know it's difficult. I know, let's say if you told her it's cancer, I don't know why she's crying, but let's say she is crying because you told her it could be a cancerous growth. Obviously that's the challenge, right? So you'll say, well, it's not definitive, Mrs. Jones. You have to run some tests, but I do understand it's difficult to hear this, but I'm here for you. Your health is my concern. We have a best staff as well here. So once the results come back and we'll sit down and discuss everything moving forward. And always be cautious, right? Stop a few extra seconds and talk to them. Don't jump over the fact that she's crying because then you won't get the points. And also it's it's rude, right? I mean, it's you have to be caring. Yeah, do you want me Slow to jump timers. in? Do you want me to jump in and do a few? Yeah, go for Where it. Where are you at? What's the time stamp? Um, so I'm at 4.10, your time. Okay. Uh, for slow typers, two differentials okay. in ball 12 oh, cases. Oh yeah, I answered that one, yeah, I answered that one. Sh so should we ask about pap smear? So should we ask about pap smear? Yeah, that's part of the mnemonic. Um, LMP pap, part of the mnemonic. Uh, Daniela says some have one. Yeah, of course. Um, if if there's a just a s super obvious, then yes. Um, and we usually always try to try to get two if you can. But if there's only one, nothing else fits. Then one's okay. We have a student who I think uh, what was it like eight or nine were just one on this on yeah. this exam and passed. So I'm not yeah. Yeah. suggesting you do that, but it's been done. So if it's very obvious in one, yeah, that's fine. And they also knew everything and they asked all the questions to really rule out all the other differentials. It's a very on strong list. student who knew what to exactly. Yeah, um, or else you do that. Right, Zara, any sequence on order of lab tests? Nope, doesn't matter, just put them in there. Uh, for dyspareunia mnemonic, how do you ask about vaginitis and cervicitis? Uh, just ask about infections. Yeah, you could say something like, have you had any infections of your of your, your vaginal region or your reproductive system at any point? That's fine. Don't get too uh, 
too fancy with that. Don't say vaginitis or herbicitis at all. They probably won't know. Uh, Natasha, if patient says that they are not interested to get a physical exam, uh, would you stop the encounter or convince them? I would say, how come you're not interested in doing a physical exam? And then listen to them. And then, you know, if, if they're worried or whatever it may be, try to reassure them and try to explain to them that, you know, in order to figure out what's going on, um, you know, in order to, you know, determine the cause of it, the vaginal bleeding or the abdominal pain or the headache, I need to do the physical exam. And if I don't, I'm not going to be able to get uh, the information I need and figure out what's wrong so that I can make you feel better. So in order to, you know, allow me to help you, I really need to do a physical exam. So with that in mind, would it be okay if we proceeded? And if they, you know, they take a stand and they say, no, I don't want you to do it, then okay, don't do it. Um, don't just leave the room though. Keep talking to them, uh, keep building rapport, and then, um, you know, document it on your note and move forward. Sometimes it happens. I mean, it's not common, but it could happen. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. Uh, just to note, guys, uh, the question period is up. So um, if anything else after 4.20 on my timestamp, we'll have to head out. It's been 90 minutes. And I know, Dr. Stavros, uh, you have someone at, five, at yeah, yep. 30 minutes. Um, keep, uh, Itayo keep says, can I perform a general physical exam, eyes, pallor? I think I already answered that. Yeah, I answered that one. Uh, we do abdominal exam instead of pelvic exam on a model. Um, exam on a, on a model. Um, if they have, I, let's say, if, one of those, like, yeah, if there's a that. model, then then yeah, you would do you yeah. would do the the, the sure. correct exam, yes. If you have a little mannequin or something, yeah, like yeah, no, if that's the case, then yeah, you're going to do the proper genital exam. Um, Adam says, any abnormality can we found on palpation, tapping, or auscultation, abdomen, CVS? Um, any abnormality can we found on palpation? Are you asking if we can find an abnormality? If that's the case, then absolutely, and document it. Um, I think that's what you're asking. I can't really tell from your question, but yeah, anything you find that's abnormal, document it. Um, how many areas of the abdomen to percuss and auscultate just to do the four? Uh, how to comfort a patient's crying? I thought you answered that one, Doc, didn't you? I did, yeah. Um, I feel like there's I feel like there's multiples of the same question. Yeah, because sometimes they'll ask it again and again, because the thing is, if we're talking guys and we're like going through the, the encounter, it's yeah. kind of hard to answer every possible question. So if you keep asking the same question, you won't yeah. be able to get it for later, yeah. right? So uh, we're doing our best, right? Um, Doc, Doc, he says, yeah. if the patient gives the history of trauma prior to bleeding, what are the differentials? I mean, whatever the trauma is, that yeah. would be the differential. For workup studies, can we always put rectal exam to rule out a rectal cause of bleeding? That is something mistaken as a vaginal bleeding. Um, I mean, you'd have to ask the right questions to be able to put that. I wouldn't just, as a rule, say I'm going to do a rectal exam. But um, you know, if they're unsure or they're not 100% sure, because you want to ask, you know, have you experienced any rectal bleeding as well? And if they say no, 100% sure it's vaginal, then keep that in mind. Do we have to tell the patient we're going to perform a rectal exam in the closure, assuming it is necessary in the setting of a ruptured ectopic ring? If you have to do a rectal exam, then tell them you're going to do one. If you don't, then don't worry about it. All right. Okay. Um, is that possible that they do the exam online? I think you're referring to what I was talking about earlier, Nika. Um, I mean, uh, you know, if they're not going to open up, who knows? Who knows? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't rule it out. You know, that's why we always tell students, uh, you know, you can train online and you can test someone online. We do it all the time and it's equally as effective. So, you know, who knows what's gonna happen, but it's quite possible. Cause if they can't get you into a, um, a room with, with all these SPs because this thing isn't under control, they're not just gonna say, we're not gonna do CS anymore. <laughs> you guys wish, we all wish, right? Um, they're gonna figure something else out and most likely it would be a scenario where you're dealing with someone interacting with them digitally. That's my speculation. It's just the only thing that I can think of. Um, uh, Ayla asks, if it's a respiratory case, do we lose points if you don't percuss and auscultate the front of the chest? Um, you know, you're not going to lose points. You, you can always do the top, the the uh, superior portion of the chest, of the uh, lungs. That's fine. Um, I don't think if you do a thorough exam, otherwise you'll probably be okay. But just for completeness, yeah, you can do those two two areas. Uh, Christina Gomez, how can I register? I'm not sure if you want to register for the six weeks, but if you want to register for the six weeks go to the upc.net slash COVID. So just to break it down for you guys, um, you've got about uh, 10 hours of lecture where we basically break down the entire structure of how you walk into the room all the way to how you leave the room. A patient note breakdown as well. 
Um, and then once a week, we're gonna jump on a live webinar like this with you guys, answer your questions, walk you through um, specific areas of the encounter. So one week we're gonna do all about the intro, the next week all about the interview, the next week all about the physical exam. And you guys will be like superstars of how to navigate a case and it's only $100. Usually our training is like $2,500 plus. Yep. So this is yep. an amazing opportunity. We're only doing this because of what's going on because we don't want you guys sitting around at home you know, going stale. We want you guys active. And so for $100, I mean, there's no, no one else is doing this. You can get access to us weekly in private groups. So it's the upc.net slash COVID. Yeah. I hope you all register because um, it would be amazing to work with all you guys more intimately and help you achieve yeah. your goals without having to spend a fortune training. Um, that's just why we're doing it. We uh, we care about you guys and we want you guys to do well. Um, can so we, can I put all the links on there, guys. So, you know, there's a link for the survival guide. There's a link for the show notes, yes. obviously. And there's also for the co for the six-week program. I mean, because you right. got to be up and running and make sure when the door's open, you're ready to go in and, and kill the test, right? So, Yeah, Camilo asks a uh, link for the theory book. So if you buy the survival guide, the theory book is included. But um, otherwise, you can only get a sample of the first four chapters. Um, but if you buy the survival guide, the theory book's included. And the theory book alone took me six months to write. It's 210 pages. Literally everything that I could possibly think of that you guys need to know. I mean, that book alone is, I mean, worth, it took me 10 years of experience to write. So it is complimentary with the survival guide. So I would definitely get that. Uh, let's see. NGC is Nat. <laughs> hey, Nat, what's up? So Thursday, there will be a webinar, Sally. Yes, um, we're gonna send out an email later on today. You're gonna register at the upc.net. It's not available yet. Don't go there and register, but we will have a webinar Thursday and it's gonna be an interactive. We're gonna bring someone on nonstop and we'll go over challenging questions. Um, also tomorrow, guys, we're doing a Facebook Live um, right from our Facebook page. And what we're gonna be doing is basically a Q&A. We've got a laundry list of questions uh, that students ask us, so we're gonna go over those. And then if you wanna just come on, we're basically just gonna do this, answer questions for you guys for as long as you needed. I mean, not as long as needed, probably just an hour, but it's gonna be just all Q&A. So instead of going over a case, any questions you have, like step one, step two, residency, whatever, come on and do that. That's at three o'clock tomorrow. And if you're on here, I will send out an email reminder for everybody, just in case you wanna jump on, uh, you can do that too. Yeah, and also left, left you guys a link on this helpful. We'd love for you to leave a recommendation review on the, our Facebook page. That'd be great. So yeah. links right there for you guys, please. That'd be, that'd be fun. Yeah, guys, like one of the things that we, are, we thrive on is helping you guys out. And we do it for free 99% of the time. Um, so we put a link actually in the show notes document I sent you. If you guys, you know, if you found this to be helpful, if you could just go to our Facebook page, click yes, we recommend us and leave us a little review. Just, you know, something simple like, you know, we're helpful or you love our webinar, whatever. Or if you want to write more, that's great. But those things are amazing to help us, you know, actually get more business so that we can actually, you know, make money and keep doing this for you for free. Because if we're doing well, we can keep doing this for you for free. Okay. So we would love it if you guys would do that. Highly, highly appreciate it. Okay. All right. um, someone asked about the lowercase doc. I see you. someone asked about uppercase, right? Can you type all uppercase? Dr. Stavros typed in, you can, but it just doesn't look good. Imagine you open a book or a magazine or anything. It's all in caps. It's like they're screaming at you. So just keep so, that in mind. You know, why, why? I mean, and that's something that everyone just defaults to caps lock. How come? I mean, I've never heard somebody say, can you do it with anything, everything in lowercase? No, so, I know, right? I literally have heard always caps lock. I'm like, why, why not go the lowercase route? Because honestly, Caps lock, like, like Dr. Paul mentioned, screaming. like you're screaming at somebody. It's also large, you know, lowercase. Either way, I mean, just, just keep typing. Guys. I, keep I would just, guys, hard. you've got, like I said, a minimum of 45 days where you can just practice your typing. Just type. It's a skill that you'll need for life. And my life is so much easier that in high school, my teacher forced us to learn how to type. I hated it. It's pain in the butt. It's unnatural. But it's like learning an instrument. Once you know where everything is, your life is so much easier because you spend it on the computer. Yeah, and honestly, I'm telling you guys, I've seen it. We've seen it live where in five days, I had one student literally typed 10 notes every day, plus the five or six we did during the encounter on our Zoom. And then he killed his exam. Got the, he actually he got the score back. He took the test, I think it was January-ish. So he got it before Corona came, so to speak. So, you know, he just, he literally busted his butt and he typed every day, all day till he was perfect. And that was it. Yeah. You, know, you got to put the effort in, guys. You have to put the effort in. 
Sally asked, Thursday is the, is it going to be IG or webinar? So Thursday is actually going to be a webinar. So tomorrow we're doing the Facebook live. Like I said, I'll send you guys a link. You just come onto our Facebook and you don't have to, you know, sign up or anything. You just come on and we're going to answer your questions. Thursday will be an actual webinar just like this. We actually might try, we're going to test out live streaming on YouTube. So we might do that as well, but you know, just, just sign up for the webinar on Thursday. That'll just, you'll all be in the same spot. Um, get your survival. Thanks. Um, let's see anything else. Anything else? I guess that is that's about it. The links are up there for everything. So take advantage of it. The book, CS program. And let's see. Just, just scrolling one last time to see if there's anything else. Sally says, please send me reminders. Uh, we're sending out email reminders and text reminders. So Sally, if you're still on here um, and you're not getting reminders, um, text the word IG Live Reminders to that number 855-240-0406. So let me just, IG Live Reminders. If you send <coughs> IG Live Reminders to 855-240-0406, um, then you'll get automated reminders. So if we do, IG lives, if we do a webinar or we do like even a Facebook live, I'm usually sending out reminders to everybody who signs up for anything on the, on the uh, text platform, just so that you guys, you know, all get the stuff. So just keep that in mind. Okay. So Sally's good here. Good. Perfect. Okay. Very helpful. See you there. Thank you guys. All right, guys. I guess that is it. Uh, that was an hour and 45 minutes. Good Lord. Yeah. I'm yeah, exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys yeah. though um, for coming. Uh, these are awesome. I think even when Corona is over, I'll probably still do one of these once a week, just because it's great to get on here and interact with you guys and yeah. um, you know get a lot of really good information. Um, someone asked about how to counsel for underage drinkers. Uh, bring that question tomorrow to the Facebook Live and we'll talk about that. Yep. All right, guys, so thank you all so much. Uh, again, the six week, $100, you're gonna get basically $2,500 program for 100 bucks, so you can't beat the price. So the upc.net slash covid thank you guys for stopping by and uh uh one more thing sig them you want the link for what for yeah i'll the, put it uh, up there weeks? again one second and also guys when you register there's an option to uh get me to train with you once a week 30 minutes one on one weeks one on one so a little upcharge but i mean it has to be because you know it's it's literally half hour zoom with me you and i <laughs> once a week for six weeks ask me anything you want CS related from top to bottom and back. So uh, we do our very best to help you guys out. And right, one last thing, guys. Uh, SIGDEM. So Doc, Dr. Stavros wrote it to you. Um, yeah, the UPC nine slash COVID. Uh, guys, every day, uh, you've probably heard, heard me say this, we put new videos and training out on Instagram every day for free. So I'm going to type mine and Dr. Stavros's Instagrams. Go and follow us because every single day we're putting out free stuff. Uh, Real Dr. Paul, that's me. I put it there. Oh, you did it? Yeah, I put a couple times on there. It's yeah. Every day we're putting out new stuff. And that's the one place where you can pretty much always get in touch with us too. If you have questions on Instagram, send us a private message and we're pretty much always on it throughout the day. So go ahead and follow us over there and uh, you'll get a lot of free training, probably enough that you uh, can figure it all out just by our free training. So anyway, let's call it a day. Be, or, uh, all right, guys, I gotta get going. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank Be you guys. Safe, stay safe. Okay, right, guys. everybody. Bye bye. Thank you guys.